Hey everyone, and welcome to What Did I Miss? Where today I'll be breaking down the fourth episode of the second season of Star Trek Picard, titled Watcher, and looking for Easter eggs and references that you may have missed. This was a very fun episode in which all the main players moved along the story while also presenting the audience with a lot of new questions about what changes have taken place in this timeline, as well as who or what is the Watcher. Even though the character was seemingly revealed at the end of the episode, it is still unclear what their motivations are, and I have a theory that I will share after I look at the episode. But before I get into that, just a quick thank you for clicking on this video. If you'd like to help support the channel, please remember to smash that like button if you enjoy the video, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you know when my latest videos come out. The title of the episode is an obvious reference to the entity that the cast has been told to look for in the century, with Picard finding a new old friend along the way for help. But I think it is also a reference to Picard's old, old friend Guinan, and what observing humanity for over 100 years has done to her. From the Next Generation episode Time's Arrow, we know that Guinan has been on the planet Earth since at least the 19th century. In that episode, after an artifact that turned out to be Data's head was found, several members of the Enterprise D traveled back to San Francisco in the late 19th century to understand why. In doing so, they also met Guinan from that time period who was hiding on Earth from her father. It turned out that they were unknowingly part of a predestination paradox thanks to an alien species known as the Davidians. With help from Guinan, Mark Twain, and even Jack London, Picard and company are able to save the day while also returning to their time period. Now you may be wondering, if in that episode Picard and Guinan met, why did Guinan not recognize Picard when they meet in this episode in 2024? Well, you have to remember the rules of a predestination paradox, which require that all the criteria be met, and if they are not, then the paradox will not occur. In this timeline that was created by Q, and that the crew are trying to fix, we know that Picard was not even the captain of a ship named Enterprise, and that he was a conqueror, not an explorer. So this Picard never had the crew he had to take on the mission in the episode Time's Arrow, which means those events in the future and in the past never occurred in this timeline. This is why Guinan does not recognize Picard, because she is living in this new timeline and Q has made it, so only the crew of the La Serena are fully aware of the changes. This episode of Picard, like the last one, is directed by Leah Thompson, who also has a history with time travel. As an actress, she was part of the most popular time travel franchise ever, Back to the Future, as she played the role of Lorraine Baines McFly in all three movies. This episode begins with Picard and Dr. Girardi trying to contact Seven, Rafi, and Rios from the La Serena before cloaking the ship and heading to Chateau Picard. Picard remarks that the cloaking device is another upgrade from the Confederation, since the Federation did not use cloaking technology for many years except in some special instances. This was part of a treaty that the Federation signed with the Romulan Empire after the Earth-Romulan War, which also established the often referenced Neutral Zone. The Next Generation episode Pegasus details many of the risks of this technology, and Picard is forced to stop another Starfleet captain from pursuing it. However, we see in the series Discovery that by the 32nd century, the Federation does use this technology, possibly due to the fall of the Romulan Empire after their son went supernova. Upon arriving at Chateau Picard, he tells Agnes a quick chronicle of his family before this point in history, which also seems to finally explain why Jean-Luc Picard has an English accent. I've always loved Patrick Stewart's portrayal of Picard, but something that has always bugged me is his accent, since the character is supposed to be from France, but speaks with an English accent. And when we meet his brother Robert in the Next Generation episode Family, he has a very thick accent. In an earlier episode this season, during a memory that Picard had relived, we saw that it was his mother who persuaded his father to move back to the Chateau from England. Well, now we know from the story told in this episode that the Picards fled France during the Second World War and landed in England, where they lived for generations until Jean-Luc was born and his mother brought the family back to France. While Picard and Agnes discuss their predicament, she unknowingly repeats the number 15, which Picard recognizes. This act of unconsciously using a number to solve a problem is very similar to the way the crew of the Enterprise D got out of their own predestination paradox in the episode Cause and Effect, in which Data used the number 2 repeatedly after a version of himself from a doomed timeline sent it to him as a hint as to how to survive the event. When Picard reveals to Agnes that he figured this out, she calls him Dixon Hill. Dixon Hill is a popular noir detective character that Picard is a huge fan of and has played him as a holodeck character in the episode The Big Goodbye and briefly in the movie First Contact. When we catch up with Seven and Rafi, they are on a bus with another man blaring some very familiar sounding punk music. This is an awesome, amazing callback to Star Trek The Voyage Home. In that movie, Spock is forced to use a Vulcan neck pinch to subdue a man and silence his boombox. The man in that scene is the same in this scene of Picard and his associate producer Kirk Thatcher. He is also responsible for the songs I Hate You that played in that scene in The Voyage Home and I Still Hate You, which is playing during the scene in Picard. After Seven asks him nicely to turn down the music, he gladly does so and makes a motion to his neck. 
no doubt remembering the neck pinch that he received from Spock. Now I do love this callback, but if Guinan doesn't remember Picard because the events of Time's Arrow didn't occur, how did the events with this guy on the bus in the voyage home occur? Are we supposed to assume that Kirk and company were not affected by the changes in the timeline? No! When Picard lands in Los Angeles, he is back at 10 Forward Avenue, which we saw earlier this season is where Guinan will once again 10 bar in the future. This is also a reference to the 10th deck in the forward section of the Enterprise D, which is also where Guinan tended bar. It turns out she has been tending bar here on Earth for quite some time as Picard meets a younger version of Guinan played by actress Ito Aguirre. Even though this version of Guinan has never met Picard, she also cares for a pit bull named Luna, and in the main timeline, Picard had a pit bull named Number One. Patrick Stewart has been honored by the ASPCA for his work with Pitbull Rescue, and I wouldn't be surprised if Luna is also a rescue dog like number one is. Rafi finds Rios using an LAPD computer, and her and Seven go off on a high-speed chase through the streets of LA. I had to chuckle when Rafi was forced to explain to Seven how to use a seatbelt, as I believe this was a quick jab at the often-referenced lack of seatbelts on Star Trek vessels, even though there's an obvious need for them. Also, when Rafi says to Seven, you can pilot a starship but you can't drive, it is very similar to an exchange between Archer and T'Pol while Archer is about to steal a car in Detroit in 2004 in the Enterprise episode Carpenter Street. When Rafi is finally able to find where Rios is being taken, she says it is to a sanctuary district on the border. Sanctuary districts are segregated areas created by the government to house poor and indigent people and were first introduced in the Deep Space Nine episode Past Tense. It is established in this episode of Picard that this crew is in April of 2024, so these sanctuary districts will last until August 30th of this same year when the events shown in the episode Past Tense take place. In order to transport Rafi and Seven closer to Rios, Dr. Girardi asks him to stop the car because the transporter is not able to handle moving targets. This is referencing the problem solved by Montgomery Scott with Spock's help, known as the Trans Warp Theory, in which Scotty was able to beam someone aboard a ship traveling at warp speed in the 2009 Star Trek movie. Guinan finally agrees to take Picard to the Watcher, who is a being that is able to inhabit the consciousness of the people around her. She also looks to Picard like Laris, but does not have any Romulan features or an accent. Star Trek has had many non-corporeal beings visit the various crews over the years, so this Watcher could be any one of them. However, I have a feeling that this being may have a connection to the Guardian of Forever. The Guardian of Forever was recently seen on Discovery during the third season two-part episode titled Terra Firma, but it originated on the original series in the episode The City on the Edge of Forever. In both instances, this being showed the ability to see and interact with different timelines and could send people back through a portal to seemingly anywhere in space-time. Besides having a similar power set, this being also described itself as a Watcher that does not get involved in the events of the universe. Just after Picard and the Watcher are magically whisked away in a smoke-filled portal, which is also reminiscent of the gateway the Guardian uses, we see a newspaper headline that Q is reading. In each appearance of the Guardian of Forever, a newspaper headline is used to illustrate changes in the known timeline. Speaking of Q, in the final scene of the episode, he is seen reading a paper asking if 2024 will be the year that revives space exploration. This is almost definitely a reference to the Europa mission that could be seen on a billboard in the last episode and on the side of a bus in this episode. In fact, the picture shown next to the article is a picture of Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter. Strangely, Q is even wearing a coat with a patch on it for the Europa mission. Also, there is a story titled Brenner Fights Unionization. This is almost definitely a reference to Christopher Brenner, a character who helped Jadzia Dax when she was stranded in the past in the aforementioned Deep Space Nine episode, Past Tense. Q starts in on a monologue about a woman at the cafe he is sitting at, but he is unable to use his powers, which surprises him. This raises the stakes a bit for the season, as it appears that if the crew are not able to change the past, then Q will not have the power to help them either. Well, that was everything I saw this week, but let me know in the comments if I missed anything. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please hit that like button if you have enjoyed it, and I will see you next time on What Did I Miss?